This video will cover the first half of the kinship lecture. Kinship basically just refers to families. So kinship systems within cultures are how people consider themselves to be related to each other. And families are just groups of people who consider themselves to be related in some sort of way. And we often think of families as being groups of people who share lineages, who have you know, the same bloodlines. And that's often a foundation for a family, but that's not the only way in which people consider themselves to be family members. <clears throat> now in anthropology, families are a very important uh, starting point for understanding a culture because family is how uh, groups of people organize themselves on a very basic level. So if we want to understand how societies are organized, we first have to understand how families are organized because societal structure often mirrors family structure. And there are many different types of families. In the West, it's very common to think that every family looks the same, every family has the same people in it. And certainly from a political perspective, um, you know, we use the idea of a family to define who is allowed to be family and who is not allowed to be family. Certainly in the United States, much of the debate over same-sex marriage has come down to, you know, what does it mean for the basic American family? But what we can see is that families look different in different places, and that's for a variety of reasons. But the way that we think of the family in the West may not be applicable everywhere. As I said, the way that we define our families affects larger aspects of societal structure. So there's an example that's used in your textbook comparing the United States and Brazil. In the United States, many people consider their family or their primary family to be the person that they're married to and any children resulting from that partnership. So your family is the family that you create. In Brazil, however, many people consider their family or their primary family to be the family that raised them, the family that they are blood related to. And their spouse has a separate family. They have their own family. How this affects, you know, uh, other parts of society, in the United States, we have a practice called neolocality that's very common in, amongst many people. Neolocality is a practice of moving somewhere new, away from the family that sort of raised you, gave birth to you, etc. And in the U.S., many people feel very comfortable moving away from the families that raised them because they feel that they are moving to a new location with their primary family. So if I move to California with my spouse and my children, it's okay because I'm taking my family with me, even if I'm leaving behind my mother, my father, my brothers and sisters and cousins. In Brazil, however, because people view the, the primary family unit as the family that has raised you, the idea of moving across the country with someone who is not your family, i.e. your spouse, is less appealing. So people tend to stay closer to the families that raised them. So how people view their family or the, the most important members of their family can end up affecting how people migrate or how people travel from one area to the next. An important understanding in, in all of this discussion of kinship, though, is that most kinship is culturally constructed, meaning that although certainly blood relations play a large part in the idea of families, uh, it's not just about blood. It's not just about you know DNA. A lot of the ways that we understand how families are grouped is because that's the cultural practice. Cultures take biology and create rules or create systems of behavior around that. So we'll see a couple examples throughout these videos of how um, cultural rules play on family organization. So first let's talk about a couple types of families. The nuclear family um, is a, you know, a sort of basic familial unit and one that many people, especially in the United States, would consider to be the most important family unit. A nuclear family consists of parents and their children, so two generations under one roof. Nuclear families are impermanent. They do not last forever. And most people belong to at least two nuclear families in their lifetime. 
That's because we are born into a nuclear family, and that's called the family of orientation. So when you are a child and living with your parents, that is your family of orientation. It's the family that gives birth to you and raises you. But then, as you become an adult, as you leave your parents and you get a spouse of your own, you have children of your own, that is a new nuclear family. And that's referred to as the family of procreation. So most people belong to at least those two types of nuclear families in societies where nuclear families are the primary unit. Some people have more than two nuclear families. Say, for example, um, you, you have your family of orientation when you're a child, and then as an adult you get married, you have children, and then maybe you get divorced and you get remarried. That would then be a new nuclear family. So some people have more than two nuclear families. For a long time, anthropologists thought that the nuclear family was sort of the, the default family structure, and that most societies around the world live in these nuclear family units. Nuclear families are widespread. We do see them all over the world, but they're not universal. And in some places, the nuclear family is not the most important family construction. Now, building off of that, we have expanded and extended families. Expanded families are basically nuclear families plus someone else. So they might include, um, you know, parents and their children and also the parents' siblings, or parents and children and cousins, or parents and children and other, you know, family members who, uh, you know, great aunts or something. Anyone who's not in that nuclear family unit but still living in the same household. And when we're talking about families, we're really referring to people who share a household. So expanded families are nuclear plus. And then another type of expanded family would be an extended family, which is when you see three or more generations in a household. So grandparents, parents, and children. And this is a very common uh, familial arrangement in many places around the world, and it's also very common here in the United States, having three or more generations under one roof. I want to introduce some terms that we're going to be coming back to um, a couple of times. The first term is patrilocal, and you can see that right here. Patrilocal refers to the practice of living with the husband's family after marriage. Now the word patrilocal, we can break this down into two parts. Patri refers to father. It's got this Latin root, meaning father or husband. And then local refers to a location. So a patrilocal family refers to the father's location. So after marriage, uh, two newly married people go to live with the husband's side of the family. We can see one example of this in Yugoslavia with this type of family structure called a Zadruga. Zadrugas are patrilocal residences where there is sort of a, um, you know, a, a father or a grandfather who is the head of the household. And all of his sons will remain in that household through their adult lives. And when they get married, their wives will come and live with them in this large household. Any daughters of the household, when they get married, they will go live with their husband's families. So women leave their families in this arrangement, and men stay with the family. In Yugoslavian Zadrugas, the practice is for a woman to marry into the family and essentially turn over all of her personal possessions to her father-in-law. So this is a society where we see uh, men certainly have a higher degree of power and control and influence within the family. Women who marry in essentially become absorbed into the family. Um, and if a woman were to leave her, her father-in-law's house, she would have to leave with basically nothing. She wouldn't get any of those personal possessions back. She might also not be able to take her children with her because this is such a male-oriented society and the residents of natural local society. So after marriage, the groom comes with his bride to his mother-in-law's house. But in this particular arrangement, uh, the groom will only stay living with his wife's family or his wife's mother for about a year. And then he'll go back to his own mother's house. And so in this society, they are so matrilocal that even after marriage, the bride and the groom will essentially end up uh, still living with their own mothers. The groom will then come to visit the bride every once in a while because their marriage is still legal. 
it's still socially recognized. Um, but in this case, marriage doesn't necessarily mean that the two people who are married are the primary family unit. Remember, it's, you know, even though we often consider marriage and blood to be the most important aspects of, mar of uh, family construction, in this sense, marriage is more of a social convention. Marriage creates networks between people, but it's not necessarily meant so that two people can live as partners for the rest of their lives. Um, and subsequently, any children that this woman has will be considered the children of her husband, her legal husband, even though in some cases he may not actually be the biological father. In this case, it doesn't really matter so much if he is the biological father of his wife's children because their marriage makes it the social convention that those are considered his children. Now, this is kind of an extreme example of a matrilocal family. Many matrilocal societies um, have the groom just moving in with the bride's family. And it's not this sort of everyone goes back to their mom's house. But what we see with families around the world is that there, there's always variation. And each culture has its own way of organizing families. They have their own rules for how people um, get married and how people disperse themselves after marriage. As I discussed before, uh, a practice that we often see in the United States and also in other parts of the industrialized world is this practice of neo-locality. So again, local meaning location and neo meaning new. So this just means moving away from your nuclear family or your extended family, your family of orientation, moving to a new place. And we do this for a variety of reasons. We do it because of job opportunities, we do it for education, um, you know, a lot of us would have no problem saying, I'm moving to Montana because there's a great job waiting for me. Even though all my family's in New York, that's okay, I need to go do this thing over here. There's also a little bit of a cultural preference for it in the United States. Uh, for a long time, the idea of moving out on your own, you know, whether it's after high school or after college or when you get married, moving away from your family, setting up your own home, being somehow, you know, independent of your family of orientation. There's a big sort of American cultural preference for this because it's, it's often taken to be a sign of adulthood in the United States. So we tend to see it happening more often here. However, um, we can also see that neolocality, even when there is a cultural preference for it, often fails. And this is usually tied to economic factors. So extended families or expanded families are often the result of uh, sort of economic hardship or attempts to be financially or fiscally responsible. If we think about this practice of neo-locality, moving away from your family, starting your own home, striking out on your own, this is a very expensive endeavor. And many people, especially in the time we're living in right now, many people go out on their own try to establish their new households, but it's just too expensive. And so we end up moving back with other members of our family and pooling our resources. And so when we live with larger family groups, this is actually a really good way to ensure that everyone in the family is taken care of, everyone gets what they need. It's a lot more financially responsible. And certainly uh, we can see this practice really took off with a lot of people in the United States after the economic downturn in 2008. And some people have even referred to people who are in their you know, mid-20s to mid-30s as the boomerang generation. Because we went out, we struck out on our own, and then we realized it was really hard out there and it was way too expensive and there weren't enough jobs, and then we turned around and came right back to our parents or other family members. So extended families are often a response to limited resources. Here I'm going to introduce to you a group of people that we refer to as foragers. Now another term for foragers is hunter-gatherers, and you'll hear me use those two words interchangeably. Foragers are highly mobile groups of people who get all of their resources from the wild. And so when we use the term hunter-gatherers, this refers to the fact that all of the meat that they eat is hunted from wild animals, and all of the plant foods that they eat are gathered from wild plants. So foragers do not farm, and they do not keep domesticated animals. Rather, they travel around their environment, so they're nomadic, and they collect 
naturally available resources on the landscape. In most forager groups, the nuclear family is the most significant kin group. Uh, so foragers are organized into groups of people called bands. Bands are comprised of typically 100 to 150 people. And a band is a group of people who are all generally related to each other in some sort of way, either by blood or by marriage. But then within that band, there will be many smaller nuclear families of maybe, you know, four or five people. And here on the right, we see um, a nuclear family from a band of San Bushmen in the Kalahari Desert. One of the reasons why the nuclear family is so important in forager groups is because of uh, how they have to deal with limited resources in their environment. Now, as being a nomadic people, hunter-gatherers are constantly traveling throughout the year to take advantage of resources in different areas. But at sometimes during the year, there's not going to be enough resources in one place for all 150 people to get enough food. So during that part of the year, the band may split apart into those smaller nuclear families. And then the nuclear families go off on their own to forage for food. And then later in the year, all of the families come back together into the larger band unit. We refer to this as fission-fusion or fusion-fission band organization. The fission refers to breaking apart, and the fusion refers to coming together. So again, this is a way of um, using family organization to better take advantage of naturally available resources in the environment. The next sort of group of people that I want to look at, we can refer to as non-industrial non-foragers, which is a very sort of cumbersome term, but if we're saying non-industrial, we're meaning people who aren't living in you know, these big sort of urban environments like we do here in New York City or even in the United States, so non-industrial nations, but also non-foragers, so people who aren't traveling around getting all of their food from the wild. Another way that we might consider non-industrial non-foragers would be farmers. There are many, many communities around the world that are not industrial but also not foraging, and these are typically farming communities. In farming communities, which are organized in villages where people live year-round, year the typical family organization is around what we call descent groups. Descent groups are groups of people who have a common ancestry, meaning that everyone shares the same ancestor. In a descent group, uh, that group membership um, it, it's constantly changing as people are born and people are dying, but you are born into a particular descent group, and it's the same descent group as your parents, and it lasts throughout your lifetime. So while a nuclear family can change throughout your lifetime, a descent group is with you forever because it is determined at your birth. And there are two types of descent groups. The first is a demonstrated descent group. This is where everyone in the community, everyone who considers themselves to be related in this group can actually trace their ancestry back to a particular person. So I like to think of this as sort of, you know, when you go to those like big family reunions um, and, you know, everyone there shares the same great grandfather or great grandfather and you have to meet in a park somewhere and everyone's got to wear the same stupid t-shirts. You don't even know half the people because there's like 200 cousins, but everyone there shares the same great grandfather and they can trace their genealogy back to that ancestor. That would be a demonstrated descent group, and it's organized around lineages. The second type of descent group is called stipulated descent. In a stipulated descent group, you don't have to actually be able to trace your ancestry back to that ancestor, but as long as you're born into the group, everyone goes, all right, yeah, you're one of us. We know that we're all part of the same group. We've all got the same ancestor, even if we don't have, you know, the genealogy to prove it. One of the things that sometimes happens in stipulated descent groups is sometimes these ancestors are supernatural figures. And so obviously if a, a deity or some other supernatural character is the ancestor for your group, you're not going to be able to trace that back through, you know, series of generations. Uh, but in, for some groups, this supernatural descent line is very important. So again, descent groups we see amongst uh, farming communities, and these can be small farming communities, you know, villages of just a few hundred people, or very, very large communities, you know, several thousand or more. 
Dissent groups also have their own internal organization, and that determines how these dissent groups are related. So one type of dissent is patrilineal dissent. And again, this is an important word that we can break down into parts. The lineal part referring to a line, meaning a bloodline, and then patri, again referring to the father's side. So a patrilineal descent group traces membership through the father's side. That means that if you are born in a patrilineal group, you are a member of your father's family more than you are of your mother's family. So the flip side of that is matrilineal descent, again, mother's bloodline. So in a matrilineal group, membership is traced through the mother's side. You are more a member of your mother's family than you are your father's family. Both of these are examples of unilineal descent, meaning one bloodline. Um, and there are societies in the world where a person belongs only to one side of their family, either their mother's side or their father's side. Many of us would probably consider ourselves to be members of both sides of our families, both our mother's side and our father's side. So we would identify that as bilineal descent. And just to call your attention to this little diagram up here, this is a family tree that's indicating matrilineal descent. And just so you know, in anthropology, we really like drawing family trees, like doing these genealogies. Circles are always women. Triangles are always men. So this shows the marriage between a woman and a man. And in this particular example, because it's charting the matrilineal descent of the group, we see that the woman is colored in, and then her children are also colored in this green. And we can trace that female family line by tracing